All right, here we go. Trey D, welcome back. Yes, yeah, sir. What's up with it, Vlad? Ready to kick up some dust and Come on. <laughs> hurt some feelings again? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we've been doing, hurting feelings. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that, but I'm all for it. Make Let's grown men real sensitive and, you know. Yeah. Truth tend to do that to some people, you know what I mean? Well, you know, in the top of the news right now is the whole R. Kelly thing. For sure. Did you watch the uh, Lifetime? Not at all. Not at all? Not at all. No interest or just no time? N no interest and I could have took time away from other things to watch it, but it wasn't that important to me because I've been around since he's been around. Not celebrity-wise, but I mean, I know when he came onto the scene with, what was that, a uh, public announcement, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I know the situation. I was familiar with the, the rumors with the Aaliyah thing, either he married her or tried to marry her, and you know, she was 15 years old, and. You know, and uh, so his music is dope. I always thought his music was great, but I've never been into R. Kelly as a person. You know, he seems kind of reclusive and in his own R&B world. I, I've been a gangster rap dude all my life. Yeah, well, the Leah thing, we actually got a copy of the uh, marriage certificate. And she's on it, but her, her age is forged to be 18 when she was actually 15 at the time. Yeah. So uh, that whole situation was kind of crazy. It was. Yeah, that that kind of, um, you know, that kind of made me uh, not really have an interest in him as an individual, mm -hmm. but, you know, hearing his music, his music always had the, the, the base. When he started doing that step in the name of love and trapped in yeah. the closet and all that, I kind of like ventured off, but the, 12 play and the, you know, stuff before then, you know, that was kind of like my shit right there, but. Well, yeah. then the sex tape came out. Wrong, so wrong, did, did so you see wrong it? on so many levels. Wish I didn't. Yeah. Wish I didn't. I feel the same way. Yeah. It's Wish like I you didn't. watch it once and say, oh man. It, well, you watch it to see if it's actually R. Kelly. That's and exactly it's actually what I R. told Kelly. my wife. I said, that's it. She said, have you watched it? I said, yeah, I watched it when it came out. I yeah. said, you know, but now reflecting on it, that's actually child pornography. Yeah, even though technically it wasn't proven to be in a court of law because as they explained in the documentary, the girl in the video said it wasn't her as well as the parents said it wasn't her. And that created a reasonable doubt in the case, which gotcha. allowed him to walk away from it. So yeah. technically, we don't know whether it's child pornography. Technically, we don't know. We don't and know. we didn't watch it for that reason. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? It was just like, exact. I told you, I told my wife, I wanted to see was that really R. Kelly. You know, I seen the exercise bike, you know, the whole, that one and the little, the pee on the broad one. You know, I don't, you know, I was just like, that's some wild shit, man, you know, to have caught on camera at the, you know, at the height of his success at that time. It was, was kind of amazing to me. I was like, damn. Why do you think, though, because you start talking about all these songs like Step in the Name of Love and, you know, Trapped in the Closet and so forth. Like, people were loving him mm -hmm. through that whole time. Right. People that had seen the tape, people knew about the tape. It was essentially the court of public opinion felt that Robert Kelly was a pedophile and yet people still danced to his music and bought his albums. That's, that's bananas. But at the same time, parallel that with Michael Jackson. You know, he had these different allegations on him. You know, rest in peace. You know, don't want to taint the man name or talk bad about him, but he had these same allegations. Kids mm -hmm. told their parents he slept in the bed with me and did this and whatever, whatever. But there was no tape. There was no tape. There was no tape. There was no tape, but at the same time, you said the court of public opinion. Yes. You and mentioned that. You're right. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And when all the allegations about Michael Jackson were swirling around, he wasn't dropping any music. No, he wasn't. That was pretty but much. But he was still touring. Was he touring during oh, that time? Oh yeah, he was still touring. 
doing shows? Oh, yeah, mostly overseas? Still, and, and, yeah, mostly overseas. Okay. Sold out like them uh, everywhere he landed. They were still bananas about him. Okay, But it True. was just an allegation. Okay. And, you know, really his his level of stardom had you kind of question, like, were they after him to get his money because he, he seemed to like kids so much? Well, they're actually about to drop a documentary about... Who, who's going to drop Well, it, it, it God accepted a Sundance... It's a documentary about, I guess, two kids that claim that Michael Jackson molested them. It's like a, it's going to be an R. Kelly for Michael Jackson, a, a surviving Michael Jackson documentary. Why now? Well, who's going to really get something out of that? You know, you guys get to tell a story that attaches y'all to Michael Jackson for perpetuity. Yeah. You know, come on, man. That's, that's well, ridiculous. You have kids. Yes, I yourself. do. Mm-hmm. If one of your male celebrity friends, we're not going to put a name onto it okay. just because it's going to sound crazy, right? Okay. But let's say one of a, a rapper that you're real cool with that's, that's way bigger than y you and, you know, everyone knows about this rapper. He said, hey, Trey D, um, I want your 10, 12-year-old kids to come spend the night at my house and we're all going to play and everything else like that. You can't come. But they're just going, you know, come to my house and play and we're going to have, you know, parties and we're all going to sleep in the same bed afterwards. Nothing going to happen, though. But, you know, we're just going to hang out. But you, you can't come. Is that cool with you? He'll probably get assaulted <laughs> right there on the spot. I mean, if I thought he was serious <laughs> telling me I can't come and you're going to play with my kids. And <laughs> I, I, nah, it, it, it would be ugly right then on the spot, and that you mentioned it, they asked Master P about it. Yeah. And Master P said, I would have been all in R. Kelly front door, you know, if he had one of my kids over there doing anything, and they was they tried to twist it like he was blaming the parents. But he said, no, I'm not, I'm just telling you what I would have did. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? As a father, I love my kids that much where that would have been my response, and then that's kind of like, that's kind of like the general consensus of a lot of people. It's like, well, damn, how come he's never been to jail? How come none of these parents have ever confronted him? Like, you know, when he was winning these Grammys and stuff, why none of them was outside boycotting and picketing and, you know, no, he's a pedophile. He did this to my daughter or, you know, I mean, and now all of a sudden, you know, it's the big thing. Okay, we got Cosby. Who we gonna get now? R. Kelly. You know what I'm saying? And you know, it's. I mean, I think people have been pimping out their kids since the dawn of time. You feel me? In the same way that a single mother in a lower income community would hope that her son joins the NFL and buys her a house and a car and allows her to quit her job, I think. And she takes money from the recruiter. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? To mm -hmm. ensure that her, yep. her son considers that college first. Right. And, yeah, real time. Same tough. way that, you know, a mother or some parents whose daughter has a natural singing ability, mm -hmm. when a superstar multi-Grammy winner comes around and they think, oh, well, he could he could get her a record deal and he could show her the industry and introducer and everything else like that, they will look the other way. Michael a lot Jackson, of R. Kelly. Do you know what I found amazing at, mm -hmm. um, a couple of months ago? Um, Aretha Franklin, rest in peace. She had, she had a child when she was 14. She had a first yeah, we, child we, uh, when she was 14. We, we years talked old. about it after she passed. Yeah, that, I mean, and it's like, and then it, it made me really. It, it revealed who she was as an artist to me. She had, she was grown at such a young age and with that voice, the songs that she sang, it just, it was, it was captivating because it was so raw, it was so much raw emotion in it. They're actually saying she had her first child at 12. 12? 12. Yeah, and there is, uh, wow. and there was rumors of uh, incest and stuff like yeah, that to go yeah. along with that. This type of shit, man. It's been going on. It's been going on. What type of mother signs off their daughter? You know, oh, I mean, I, Woody that, Allen? That, no, that happened in my neighborhood, actually. Yeah, one of, you know, one of the older homies was digging one of the homies' daughters, and 
I don't think he was aware of it actually. I don't think he was actually even on the streets, but hollered at her moms and like, yeah, she coming with me. And to believe she was like 16, 17 years old. And uh, you know, I, I heard he slid her a little bread and out they went. <laughs> I was like, wow. Whoa. That's the mother of the year right there. You did. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whew. Yeah, it's heavy. I mean, you know, the people have been pimping their kids out for a long time. You know, like a lot of them boy bands. What's the dude had all them allegations against him? Chris Stokes. Yeah, I interviewed Raz B. Right. <laughs> we, uh, he didn't want to talk about it. I kind of, you know, no, of I wasn't even talking about Chris Stokes. Oh, who are you talking I'm about? I'm talking about the one who oh, had oh, the, uh, the white dude. Yeah, the, the white ones dude who had in sync or Backstreet Boys. Backstreet Boys. Yeah, yeah. the Backstreet. He boys. went to prison for that shit. Yeah, yeah. He was he was molesting. Yes, he was molesting them boys. Yes, and stuff he was. Like that. I, I can't remember his name, but uh, yeah, sleaze bag, big ass sleaze bag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pedof uh, pedophilia is something that nobody respects across the board. Shouldn't. I mean, but it seems like America understands it, though, because why is these dudes getting caught for this stuff and getting uh, 16 months probation and, you know, two years community service and, yeah. you know, three years? But, you, you know, conversely, you know, you commit a felony, as they call it. You know, you're trying to feed yourself or your family or whatever, and you're getting 10 years and... 10 years for the gun and five years for the charge and three years for the prior, you walk out court with 18 years, but here this guy been molesting kids in schools for the last three, four years, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he gets he gets two years um, in, the, in the little cushy little joint and, you know, uh, everything, you know, loses teaching license or something like that. I mean, they even got, um, they even got a story about uh this 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 teacher uh no it's not a teacher it's uh this hospital, um the lady was in the coma for ten years and got pregnant, and and wound up pregnant wound up pregnant probably by that's one of the, the biggest delayed pregnancy ever. <laughs> the seed must have been sitting in there and then all of a sudden you know no I'm I mean she she, she got raped. Of course she did. Yeah, she got raped. Of course you got yeah, you got sick old motherfuckers like that. When they find out who did that, it they might be did, Bill Cosby's they baby. DNA you know what I'm everybody. <laughs> that might be Bill Cosby's baby. You mm -hmm. never know, man. I'm just saying, Bill Cosby into that type of thing. Man. He might have been going, you know, from comatose to comatose <laughs> hospital saying, Hey man, listen, it should be ten thousand dollars. Let me just go up in here. They it seems like now that what they doing is any not any person of stature, but if you, I mean, even what they did to Kevin Hart for the Grammys, you know what I'm saying? They go back on an old tweet that he put up or some old jokes he made or something. Man, everybody was homophobic at 15, 16 years old, unless you knew, understood, or you had, you know, some, some family member or somebody that was close to somebody you knew, and then, you know, you accepted them for who they were or whatever, but especially in the black community. Yeah, homophobia is, is fucking second nature in the black community, you know? Yeah, well, it's changing now. It's changing uh, now. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully, I mean, I'm with live and let live, man. You know, that's where I didn't grew to, to, to stay. It's know? changing now, and we'll see where we, you know, 10 years from now, maybe they'll say we weren't, uh, we were too homophobic also. You never know. You they never know. say that about me anyway. I don't <laughs> give a fuck. <laughs> Last time we talked, we talked about some of the, the customs within black gangs and Mexican gangs. Mm-hmm. And that caused a big uproar. Yeah. Yeah. I think it spilled for, for over. For what it's worth. I, I don't think it was. I, I think it was only big because it was us that did it. I think that was the only reason, you know, because, you know, it really was. It, it was it was exposed on a platform that it doesn't usually get talked about. Right. On. Because. I don't know about you, but I didn't get any like OG calls over this. I didn't get any like, you know, cause I interview a lot of pretty prominent people. No, mm -hmm. none, no one that I interview said, Hey man, uh, what you're saying, 
could be problematic, this, that, and the third. It's I really just the commenters and the either. Yeah. It's just it's just people in the comments. That's exactly what that it are was. That, that are so upset. None yeah. of the people actually involved, none of the black or Mexican OGs looked at this and said, yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much how it is. Yeah, because what we talked about, I don't know, it was pretty cut and dried, and it wasn't nothing negative alluded to in the conversation at all, you know. But other people had said things and rebutted mm -hmm. that I came to understand, and you know, people took it a certain way. Well, people are always gonna take shit the hot, you know, the way they take it. So there it is you know man we we still here it's a brand new year you know we still smiling so right because it's just an interesting type of thing because i just did an interview with freeway ricky ross mm -hmm. and he's the one that kind of started that. that conversation with me mm -hmm. that yeah, sort I saw of that. carried on and so forth he so was we, talking about the structure between, the structure yeah, the structure yeah. mm -hmm. and um he took it a step further he talked about during all his prison time, and he was locked up for, I mean, he got life at one point mm -hmm. and ended up doing a lot of years. He said that Mexican gangs, you know, people in Mexican gangs aren't even allowed to share a cell with black people. With the Mexican gang, they already have their laws. Yeah. And you're gonna follow their laws. Yeah. Like, uh, you can't sleep in a cell with a black guy. Really? No, it's against the law. A Mexican gang member cannot have a black celly. No. He has to go to the hole. So he has to basically fight that guy if, or, or, or something of if, that. If, if the numbers are, are level or it's going to be a war, then he has to go to the hole until a, a, a Hispanic cell open up. Most definitely. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. But now he was in federal prison. Yes. Now you have state prison, which is what probably 80, 90 percent of the people go to because they commit state crimes, you know, regular felonies. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it's the same way as state prison. But what he saw there doesn't necessarily translate to how it gets down, how, how they get down in the state. You know, they probably still have the same structure and the same execution and all that, but it's variations depending on where you at in what prison, because the prison I did the last of my time at, um, they couldn't be on the yard. Uh, the, the ones who were official, they couldn't stay on the yard with us no more than three days before they took off on somebody mm. because they had declared CMC to be a, a, a non-political prison where they couldn't politic because it, blacks was like 70%, 80% of the population. So they couldn't come there and run the penitentiary when there's so many black people. So it was like, well, that's a no good prison. So whoever stays there, you're going to get checked on the no good list. You know, you got three days to be there, figure out your target, go handle your business, and get off the yard. So, so. they purposely attack somebody mm -hmm. to get transferred out of that prison? Yeah. Completely. Yeah. You can't just walk to the, to the police and be like, well, you know, I can't be here. You know, no, you got to handle your business. You got to get you a strike okay. on the way out the door. So, so that's the way the process works. If you're trying to get out of a specific prison, for whatever reason... No, 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 just that prison, because if you stayed in that prison, you were regarded as either a snitch or child molester. Uh, they had uh, one of Manson's uh, people there. Hmm. And this only was for whites and Mexicans. Black people, you know, it's just normal population. You know, everybody come do your time and do what you got to do. But for them, since they couldn't politic the yard, then they, you know, they wouldn't allow none of their people to stay on the yard and be considered still official. What percentage of the population was white at CMC? Um, about 7%, 6 7%. One in 20? One in 15, something like two. that? Two. Two yeah. out of 20. One out of 20, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. 
And were there actual like white gangs and so forth, the Aryan Nation and so forth? They, once they they consider dropouts once they stay in the prison that I was at for so uh -huh. long. The one I did the, now the first prison I was at, Salinas Valley, it was like cracking. So everybody from you know the Nazi lowriders and the Aryan Brotherhood and all that, they was official. So they came out and got down when it was time to get down or whatever. Matter of fact, when I got up there, they had just killed. Um, a police officer or whatever, and we was on lockdown. They killed one of the COs up there, hmm. and we was on lockdown. So they was very active up there. In CMC, though, since they couldn't be there, they was considered dropouts, and, you know, they, they didn't have no ranking or respect among, you know, whatever car they represented prior to them staying there past the, the 72 hours. Well, when you're outnumbered, okay, so let's take a look. You're talking about 5 7% white. When you're outnumbered, by all the blacks, and you're outnumbered four to one by the Mexicans. What no, happens? No, the Mexicans there, the, the population of Mexicans was there was probably like 20%. Okay, so you're well, you still outnumbered two to one okay. by the Mexicans and outnumbered seven to one by the blacks. What happens to you at that point? How Do you get fucked with or? You just No, you just do your time, you know what I mean? You, okay. you kind of like get out the way and let it happen, you know, whatever going on around you, you try to pretty much steer clear of it. That's how I seen them operate, those who stayed there. And you know, some of them be cool, you know. They, they, ain't, they ain't dropouts with us because they wasn't from our gang. Y'all decide to stay here for whatever reason. Okay. You know, that's y'all business, you know what I'm saying? As long as you respect who I am and how I get down, I ain't tripping off you. I just interviewed Lil D, Daryl Reed. Mm -hmm. He was uh, known as the crack king of Oakland. By 20 years old, he was a multimillionaire. He, people said he was Felix Mitchell's uncle, but that's not exactly true. It, Felix Mitchell was his uncle. Well, no, no, no. They said he, was he Felix said Mitchell. he said that Felix. People were saying that that Felix Mitchell was his uncle, but it wasn't actually true. It was just, you know, the big homie in the neighborhood that took him under his wing, and you know, he was affiliated with Felix's crew, the Six Nine Mob. Mm -hmm. So at 20 years old, he was a multimillionaire and he ran the coke trade in Oakland. And right after his 20th birthday party, he got snatched up by the DEA and ultimately given 35 years. Of which he did? 28. 27 years, 10 months. Some interesting things we're talking about, you know, we had talked about in the story. Um, one of which, when he got picked up, he accepted right off the bat that it was over. When they, when they, kicked, when they came through that door, put them cuffs on me, I said, man, all the pretty girlfriends, man, and the fights in Vegas, and Rodeo Drive, and count all the money, the party's over. So what I'm saying is, the fact that I accepted that reality from the start, when that guilty verdict came, I was already preparing myself mentally for that, you know? But I didn't think they was gonna give me 35 years because of my record. But what they did was, they got these different enhancements, where they put these enhancements on your original guidelines, and then your sentence, Go from here to here. He had a ledger with a bunch of names in it. He said, I don't know whose names those are. <laughs> yeah. He had a baby that was born right after he got locked up. They offered to put him in witness protection. He turned him down. He played by the, by the code. Yeah. Do you know a lot of people that did that? I know a couple. Football numbers. I'm not talking five, ten years. I know a couple. Yeah? Yeah, I know a couple. I mean, you know that. I mean, generally, that's that. That was the guideline to be a part of this lifestyle. And you had to accept the consequences of everything that came with it. And then, you know, as it as it got more widespread and people started letting the wrong people in, we talked about this before. You know, people started letting the wrong people in for the wrong reason. You know, because he had, you know, the ability to, you know, attract a lot of girls and they like to hang out with him. Oh, this the homie, let's mess with him so we can go get the girls with him. Or, <laughs> you know, he knew where to get off a sack at, you know, so it was a lucrative 
you know, move to put mm -hmm. him to align him with the gang. So a lot of that, uh, a lot of it, when it got tainted, it just went bad. But that's how people used to play, man. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm taking my weight and I'm going down with it, you know, do or die. You know, you don't even really hear that much anymore. You know what I'm saying? You don't hear people use them phrases they used to use back then, you know. Do you personally know someone that took 20, 30 years because they would not tell. Yes. And are yes. and served it or are still serving it? Served it and is back out on the streets right now. Can you, can you say who it is? Standing tall. Yeah, my homeboy, Crybaby. Crybaby. Yeah. Shout out to Crybaby. Yeah, shout out to Crybaby. Long Beach Finest. Yeah, on the Okay. <laughs> he, he took a charge. What did he get uh, convicted of? Murder. Murder. Okay. How many years? Uh, I think Crybaby did like 25 years. I don't know what years. his original sentence was. He did like 25 years. Got back out. Okay. Knowing what you know about the situation, could Crybaby have cooperated and... Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was more names to be Okay, so it was, some, it was some big messy yeah, situation. No, it wasn't him doing something and he had to take the time because it was him alone. And That's what I'm saying. He could have went and told on some people selling dope around the corner and they would have gave him leniency. No, it okay. was other people that was involved in the crime, you know what I'm saying? Allegedly. Allegedly. You know, and... Uh, yeah, but he, he took the charge. He was convicted of it. Man. And he wouldn't tell on anybody. He didn't tell on nobody. There was an interesting, someone has sent me this uh, the skit. I think it was called Walking the Yard. It's like these two dudes that are walking the yard and we're just talking about jail situations. And they're talking about a situation like this. Okay, I, I'm involved in a crime with some other people. I'm a stand-up dude. I don't snitch. I take the charge. I do the time. I come home. Where's the win? Where's the what? The win. The win. Where is the win? What do you win because you follow the rules? You know, when you follow the rules in a game, there is a prize at the end of that game. The prize, the prize is that you can still look at yourself in the mirror and you can still go around your same peers as before and get accorded the same level of respect that you always did. And you're able to maneuver in that same circle and beyond just because now it's official that, you know, you're a stand-up guy. And ain't nobody going to question that. So it is a benefit to it. It's not an actual reward, but it's a definite benefit quite to a, it. Quite a price for a benefit that... So what, you going to tell and be a rat <laughs> motherfucker the rest of your life, ducking and hiding motherfuckers and see who might recognize you and you can't go to Walmart to get you some toilet paper and, and, and some bath towels because somebody just, might... Or, or you can just move. Yeah, you can't move. Nah, it's not that simple. Nah? Nah, it's not that simple. Somebody will recognize you or know or hear. You got a cousin, you know what I'm saying, an old baby mama. You know, yeah, it ain't hard to find a motherfucker yeah. at all. You got you got relatives in Idaho and Kentucky. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so easy to find somebody in America. It really is. Okay. It really is. <laughs> it really is. You know, so, I mean, if, if, you, if you opt for, you know, hey, man, I said I was going to stand up like this and I was committed to all this, but now that it happened, I changed my mind. That's not fair to everybody who, who, who trusted you with the secrets and with the, you know, with the, with the structure. You know what I'm saying? It's like you, you violated everything you said you was going to commit to. Now, I'm not going to ask about specific situations, mm -hmm. but have you heard of someone that snitched on people and ended up dead. Ah, uh, yeah. You've heard of this situation happening. Before or after the trial? After. Aha. So they've already done the damage. Mm -hmm. So that's just the Or I, I mean, even while going to court. You know what I'm saying? While court was in, you know, in progress. Yeah, you know, the clock is ticking. Up, like, I got to yeah, hurry up and up get rid of this guy know? or else yeah. I'm about to go to I, yeah, yeah, prison. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's the policy. You know what I mean? And if you adhere to the policy, you, it, it don't matter if it's your brother or, you know, a close friend or, 
you know, you gotta you gotta you gotta swallow that, man, and 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 handle it. If you going if you going if it's going to continue to be a code in the guideline, otherwise it's just anarchy and chaos right. in the G world. <laughs> we talked about how for a few years Lil D balled out. Mm -hmm. Had Maseratis, had all the chains, the girls. His 20th birthday party, 2,000 people showed up. MC Hammer was there and performed. It was, he was living it. Yeah, right. And then he went to prison for 28 years. And 10 and, months. And ten, 27 years, 10 months. Oh, okay. In prison, eight years more than he'd been out of prison. Um, I asked him if it was worth it. And he said he'd be a damn fool to tell anyone that balling out for a couple of years is worth it. Man, if you're trying to be like me, you're a damn fool. And then they asked me, why would I be a damn fool? I said, man, I just did 28 years in prison. I, you want to be like me? And then I tell to them, I tell them that they need to think about the consequences. You can go do a flashback of the conversation that me and you had about, <laughs> about the brother uh, BMF, uh, Big B Meech. Big Meech? Yeah. You, and you asked me pretty much that same question. Mm -hmm. and I was, no, Look, balling out for ten years ain't worth going to give up damn near three decades of your life inside yeah. of a box. Yeah. No, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I mean, he would love to be on the streets eating top ramen and chili, and you know, going oh, to yeah. look at going to look at the beach and watch the sunset. You know, talk to a girl. Yeah, <laughs> hold her hand and walk up the street. Yeah. You know. I mean, my wife always tell me, you know, you on your way home now. You know, it's a bunch of traffic. I'd be like, traffic. Do you know, how, you know how many times I stared out the window and said, I would just love to be sitting in traffic right now. And you tell, I got music, I got a blunt, I got a cell phone. You know, what is traffic? I don't yeah. know what traffic is. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I interviewed Freeway Ricky, and his plug was actually an informant that ended up testifying against him right. and gave him life in prison. I said if uh, Blandone, you know, the guy that ended up getting him locked up ultimately, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if he walked into the room right now, what would you do? He said nothing. What would happen if he walked in the room right now? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I have absolutely nothing against him. Really? No. Nah. wasn't his fault. See, the way I look at it is, first of all, I made the mistake of getting in the drug business. That's a heavy acceptance of responsibility right there. Well, you have to accept responsibility. Yeah. As an adult. You, you should. Mm hmm You should. A lot of people still don't. That's why, you know, they in the situation they in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He accepted that as part of the game. Mm-hmm. Now, you yourself were not a drug dealer. No. Or you were a robber. Mm hmm But you were getting snitched on also. Mm. We talked about a snitching situation. That well, the, the, the robberies that I was doing, the people really couldn't snitch on me. Okay. Because they oh, was on the other side of the law, most, most of the robberies. Let me, let me rephrase that then. As a criminal, overall... Mm hmm you were snitched on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, be, that whether you, whatever rules you had in your own head, the rules of that game included getting snitched on. They did. Do you know anyone that had been a criminal for a long time and nobody ever snitched on them? Yeah, yeah. You do? <laughs> yeah. That's a real thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, to my knowledge, no one has snitched on them. I don't know. They might be under investigation. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? They might have a deal with the law, you know what I'm saying, where they let them operate with impunity. Mm -hmm. I have no clue. But I know some guys that have been in the drug game for a long time and never went to prison, you know, never been arrested, to my knowledge. So... How? But I mean, it's like maybe it's like maybe two guys, and they're right. older, and they you know you know they 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 don't really sell heavy drugs. It's like you know it's it's like more of a hustle, and I think they probably just get allowed to you know maintain their little small two three dollar hustle, you know, 
with what they sell and they just get ignored because it's not really a den on society and it's not really debilitating anybody. Right, because... Now, you're talking about a crack dealer or somebody like that or, you know, because I know people have been in the weed game, too, that just sold weed right. all their life and, you know. Well, I mean, it's an interesting point because, you know, when I talked to Lil D, he said that what he changed about the drug game in Oakland is that unlike under Felix's, you know, watch, there was a lot of violence. Mm -hmm. He came in and said, look, we're going to stop fighting with each other. The violence is what's causing everyone to get arrested. He was smart. You got to feed the troops. I mean, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But but the violence, you know, he even said, you know, at first when he was doing just weed, he said not a lot of violence in weed, so the cops didn't really care about all that shit. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, when you get into them heavier drugs, you know, you, it's, you're bringing a different element into that community. Mm -hmm. You know, and people, people on heavy drugs tend to do outlandish things to make sure they can sustain their habit. Well. Yeah. So I get it. But yeah, you know, I know a couple of people that have been hustling for a long time and, you know, it's like, shit, they got a license to do that shit. So, recently, I, uh, I did a post. Mm -hmm. And I, I put up the obituary of Easy E, wow. which I'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen it? No, I haven't. This is it right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Easy E's actual uh, obituary. So I posted it up, and I left a caption about rest in peace, Easy E. And then I went on and started talking about how AIDS is real and how it's important to use condoms and get yourself checked and your partner checked. And, you know, there is home testing that you could do for HIV and there's a pill called Truvada that you could take to potentially avoid HIV and, you know, and take your health seriously. Right. This caused a big uproar, right, to the point where people are like, I can't believe you're using a dead man to promote HIV awareness and so forth to the point where one of Easy es daughters, daughters, Re, made a video uh, about me. I'm going to go ahead and play it for you. Easy e has 11 kids, by the way. Right, right. Uh, this is one of the younger ones, I believe. Okay. I just wanted to speak actual factuals right now. Um, in reference to that post that that lame ass dude posted, I'm not even too mad about the Suge Knight post like that. Like, okay, whatever, it's not real. But for you to post my dad's obituary and say rest in peace, but to follow after Thomas some AIDS is real, use a condom, when he knows because he's spoken to a few members in my family in reference to my dad and knows that it's not AIDS that killed my father, that shit pisses me off. Like, you're a lame. I never known anybody to be so lame in the media like this. Like, you you cancel for real, bro. Like, chill out, chill out. Respect my family. If you want to say rest in peace, how you disrespecting my dad's legacy by saying AIDS is real? Use a condom. Like, nigga, that's not even the case, and you know that. Like, you know that my daddy was murdered, and you know that shit. So that's what pisses me off that you continuously can sit here and post bullshit about other people in the industry. You ain't helping us. Did you know her dad was murdered? Well, I don't think her dad was murdered. I think her... That's what I mean. That was her allegation. Like, you know. I I have interviewed... Well, anyways, I, I'm, I'm going to get to my response. Gotcha. Because I, I actually, you know, I rarely respond, but when there is something to talk about mm -hmm. and there is a bigger picture here, True. I respond. So, number one, I, I have interviewed people around him as well as his oldest son. Mm -hmm. um, when you saw that, what did you think? When I saw that, I thought she was saying that you knew her dad had been murdered and then you was just using that as a way to promote AIDS awareness. Yeah. That's what I, that's how I received it. I, I, I put up a poll. She mentioned the Suge Knight thing. 
Because I, I, I saw all in the comments, it's like, he didn't die of AIDS, Suge Knight injected him. It was Suge Knight, it was Suge Knight, it was Suge Knight. So I said, how did Easy e catch AIDS? From having unprotected sex or Suge Knight injected him? I did a poll, over a thousand people responded. 60% said Suge Knight injected him. They gave that guy should way more credit than he probably should have should have gotten that said, I can I know should. I can't see Shug walking around with no vial or AIDS and then talking about what time we going to the hospital. I can't see Shug doing that. Shug could be like, look man, y'all fools get ready, look about two o'clock is business, y'all go up there. I can't yeah, I can't. And I don't think I don't think they had it, you know, I don't think they had that depth of animosity between them. I don't think. I don't know for a fact because I wasn't even in the music game then at that time. But I can say for sure that um I never saw Easy in no time when we was when we was, you know, performing right. or hanging out or none of that. I not, never saw him when I was dealing with Snoop and Nate and, and the dog pound up at Death Row. Well I, I responded to her. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I recently did a post about EZ's passing, and I talked about AIDS and AIDS awareness in that post, and I still stand behind the statement. There are 37 million people living with HIV, mm -hmm. with 2 million new cases yearly. Now, I, I went on to say that re responded to my post and said that I know for a fact that her father didn't die. Uh, from AIDS. Now, I have the most respect for Easy and his family. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I've interviewed Lil Easy, his oldest son, and then a bunch of his artists like Bone Thugs, DJ Yella, DOC, Michelle A, Arabian Prince, Cold 187, I'm Beachy Naka, Dreyster. Wow. That's <laughs> a lot. The whole roster. <laughs> almost the whole roster. Yeah. 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 And while some of those people have mentioned that they feel the Shug or the CIA secretly killed. Easy E, I don't subscribe. I go to more. I go more with CIA than I would before death. Right, I would. Well, I actually looked up Easy E's final statement. Mm -hmm. There was a letter that was read by his lawyer, uh, maybe a week or so before he passed. Mm -hmm. And in that statement, Easy said, "I've got thousands and thousands of young fans that have to learn about what's real when it comes to AIDS." Like the others before me, I would like to turn my own problem into something good that will reach out to all my homeboys and their kin. Because I want to save their asses before it's too late. I'm not looking to blame anyone except myself. I have learned in the last week that this thing is real and it doesn't discriminate. It affects everyone. I remember that statement. I do remember that statement. So when they say there's no proof that Easy died of AIDS, Easy himself admitted I remember that. I don't remember how they um, actually uh, verified that that was from Easy. But how, what did did he? His write lawyer, it his lawyer, his lawyer read it to you know a bunch of journalists that's just outside how it the happened. hospital. Yep, that's just. You can how look it up. Happened. There's a clip on on that's YouTube. That's just how it happened. I remember it. Outside the hospital, his lawyer read this statement. I do remember that. Now, people are going to say, oh, he didn't really write it, and they forced him to write. It. You know, there's always a conspiracy theory. Always. To to counter <laughs> yeah, reality. Always. always. <laughs> but I mean, I feel like as long as you got the understanding with, you know, the family that, you know, you wasn't disparaging him and you got the utmost respect for him and then, you know, you just expressing a viewpoint. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. then you got it substantiated by something that his lawyer even confirmed. So, you know, hopefully hopefully um, you know, they won't feel no kind of bitter feelings towards you, you know, for yeah. Expressing your opinion. You know, I also mentioned that in a Howard Stern interview, Easy E admitted that he never used condoms. Right. He never uses condoms. Right. Howard Stern said never, he said never. Yeah. And he had eleven kids at the time that he passed, at thirty one years old. Yeah. So clearly he was very sexually active as well. True that. Um and it's been twenty five years since Easy E has passed and there's still no cure for AIDS. Mm -hmm. And I don't want, you know, I just want to make sure that these last words by Eazy E have a positive effect on people and don't get overshadowed by conspiracy theories. Man, because ultimately, man. if you feel that a heterosexual man like Eazy cannot catch AIDS, you are probably going to be a little bit more reckless than if you feel that a heterosexual, that Eazy 
fucked around a lot, never used condoms, was fucking every groupie, you know, yeah. in hip hop right. <laughs> in LA yeah. and, and no, all I around. I think it actually made a lot of more people strap up. Yeah. After that, it really did. I, I, I believe it actually did. But, but 25 years you know, later, people have forgotten these words and these statements. And this, to me, was my overall intention. Yeah. People think I'm trolling or I'm trying to use easy for clout or views or clicks or whatever else. I had an overall strategy. Well, if you had AIDS, then that might be something that somebody could say, you know, oh, you're trying to use him to bring attention to what you got in your situation. But being that you don't. I'm HIV negative. I just got tested again. So. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Being that you don't, you know what I'm saying? I, uh, yeah. Then. Has nothing what to do was, with me. What would the benefit be for you? It's to the community and to all the people who think that he was secretly killed and a straight man can't get. HIV and you know Magic Johnson was really gay that's why he he's got HIV you know but I'm straight so I never have to use a condom you know everyone talks about their pullout game my pullout game is strong motherfucker what's your condom game yeah yeah <laughs> that's what you should be more con- concerned don't about cost number six dollars a box right say your life exactly yeah exactly. say your life six dollars a box man you know and, and it, it particularly hits black women Mm. very hard. Mm. They have a disproportionate number of cases in America. And it's it's a disease that although is it is manageable, there is no cure. You have it forever. And take this shit seriously, because Easy E did die from it. Right. 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 I ain't got no dispute. I have not seen the same thing you say. I seen his lawyer come out there and get that statement that he made. I remember that day real well because I was like, damn, it!" because it happened so swift. It was like easy in the hospital, dying of AIDS. Like, what? You know, and then, you know, that was the, that everybody was locked in on it until, you know, until the, to the passing. So. Yeah, man, it's real. And protect yourselves. Right. Because not only can you get it, but you can pass it on. To other people, if you don't get tested on a regular basis, you could have it for years and not know it. Real talk. Do you know people that have died of AIDS? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. A lot? Couple. Couple. Anyone close to you? Um, well, was, one was a, a family member, an in-law, and uh, the other... Well, my homeboy was dying uh, from it. I didn't. He passed. He actually passed from it. He used to shoot heroin and stuff in jail. Mm. Was an older homie of mine. And um, when I went to Chino, they had like a, a AIDS unit on the violation yard. It was called Del Norte. And I remember walking around and I saw him real skinny and he was leaning up against the gate and he was trying to get my attention. I'm like, shit, I don't know nobody over there. You know what hmm. I mean? And I looked and I was like, wow, that's my boy. I'm like, man, what happened? I was just in Tracy with him from mm-hmm. um, penitentiary like a few years before that. And he's like, yeah, you know, you know, I fuck with that dope man. Shit, you know, bad move. I was like, wow. So, you know, yeah. Some real shit. Yeah. It's some real shit. You'll yeah. die from it and have a really terrible death in the process. Right. A slow, painful, deteriorating, hard to watch for, you know, your family type death. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, I encourage everybody to strap up, man. You know what I'm saying? If you ain't got just one you 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 locked in with and both of y'all know y'all yeah. have been tested and what y'all working with, you mm-hmm. got to strap up, man. You can't be free balling out there, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the lick, you know what I'm saying? Especially, you know, with everybody trying to, you know, flex and floss, you know, it's like, you know, the, 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 the whoever shining the brightest gonna get the chick. You know what I'm saying? Usually, so let, let me. I'm just gonna put it in perspective for everyone out here. Mm-hmm. Okay, to all the fellas that are watching, this going like, whatever. Vlad and Trey, you know what the fuck they talking about? He's eating down a damn AIDS. Right. Okay. I want all the men that's watching this to to think for a second. Okay. Picture this. You the hottest dude in hip hop. Mm-hmm. Right? You the hottest dude. Go ahead. Think of all the baddest Instagram chicks, all the baddest, 
you know, IG thoughts and models and all these girls that you see on the internet and, and in music videos. Go ahead and fuck every one of those girls raw. After doing that, do you think you're going to walk away without catching something? <laughs> Go ahead and smash all the girls that you see all them rappers and athletes with and whatever else. Hit every single one of them without a condom. And are you going to think at the end of the day that you, you are totally clean and, and everything's good? No. I mean, they, people is getting convicted for that because people don't usually tell. I had a guy I knew he was from L.A. and um, he called it. and He was in that same unit over there I told you my boy was at and he was like uh, when I get out I'm fucking every bitch in my hood I don't give a fuck I don't know who gave me this shit and, and I'm, I'm oh and he, he he was HIV positive yeah and he was telling one of his home you know he was Ugh. telling one of, one of the dudes that we knew and I'm like did he I said oh wow so I everybody I knew from that hood I let him know you know your homeboy got <laughs> they was yeah. like no nah, we know we know you know what I'm saying well and that you know most of them knew but yeah, that'd be the attitude people take on. I don't know who gave it to me, so fucking, I'm gonna kill everybody with me, you know. And that's it's fucked up. That's why I still, you know, pervasive as it is. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, people that really need to consider that though. Yeah, you can't you, you know, if you keep rolling the dice, man, it's like playing Russian roulette. Well, it's like give... playing Russian roulette. That <laughs> motherfucker might you might miss it eight times. That ninth time, wow. <laughs> Last thing you do. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna tell everyone. There's a few things that a lot of people don't know about, which I talk about, which I'm going to repeat. There's a product called OraQuick. Mm -hmm. It's at damn near every pharmacy. It's around 50 bucks. It's a home HIV kit. Right. You take Aura it. OraQuick. OraQuick. Mm -hmm. 40, 50 bucks. You rub it under your gums. You put it in 30 minutes, like a pregnancy test. Comes out. One stripe, you're good. Two stripes. You should probably go get another test. <laughs> right, right, right. You could sit there with your partner, the both of you can get tested. Mm -hmm. If you choose not to use condoms, and at least you know that one of you is not HIV positive. Mm -hmm. There's also a pill called Truvada, which you could take on a, on a daily basis, which is 99% effective in, in um, preventing HIV if you come in contact with it. Oh, so it will stop you from getting it. Stop you. Truvada. Not, not perfect. It's been known to be 99%. There's been three cases because someone pointed out, it's like, oh, there's been three guys that caught HIV being on the on that pill. Mm -hmm. I actually looked up the the third case was a gay man in Europe, and uh, you know they actually you know they they asked for your stats, how many people you had sex with, mm -hmm. you know, to figure out how you caught it. This guy had sex with seventy five men in one month. <laughs> Nah. That pill was not able to stop that. Nah. <laughs> that nah. pill said, fuck this shit, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're on your own. Yeah. <laughs> pill stopped at the throat. <laughs> like, I ain't going down to that shit. <laughs> Damn. 75. He had 75 different partners in one month. Man, I, I know some dudes that did this swing with a lot of chicks, man. I, I don't know. I don't know if none of the dudes I know like that can say they just ran through seventy five girls in a month. Well, they probably that's, weren't gay either. So he's, he's thinking you got you just got men. So you got two, you got dudes who are fucking and other dudes who, are, you know what I mean? So it's just that a bunch of fucking. That shit is nasty as fuck. Yeah, man, so seventy five. So, anyways, it is possible. It's not one hundred percent. This is why if you're going to be out there, you could protect yourself in multiple ways. Mm. Okay, well, I mean, and and also, you know, if if you know that you lead that kind of lifestyle, you have to get checked. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, if you don't want to have no kids and bring them in the world that's already infected and, you know, they you, you yeah. dooming them to an early death, yeah. you know? So, yes, yeah, it's, it's really important. I, I went to a facility where they had made us get checked before they allowed us in the facility. It was, mm -hmm. a, it was a federal holding facility where I was doing some county time at. And, uh, yeah, it, it's scary to get – it's scary when you ain't knowing. Yeah. But, boy, when you get them results back and you know you good, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, you really start having a lot of respect for good year. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That rubber. <laughs> Were you considered dog pound or no? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're considered dog – under the dog pound umbrella, mm -hmm. which includes Daz and Corrupt, as well as I was a part of the dog pound before the East Siders even came to fruition. Okay, so who who's part of the dog pound? You know, the dog pound. The dog pound is Daz and Corrupt. 
That's the dog pound. The group. Gang. Yeah, the dog pound gangster clique. You got Snoop, Daz, Corrupt, Nate Dog, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Myself, Goldie Loke, Ty Cuz, rest in peace. L Dog, rest in peace. Badass. Badass. Um, technique. Mm, little C style, hmm. little half dead, hmm. big C style, South Central, um, cognac, cola, and Chan, Superfly, hmm. Hmm. a lot of people. Just a couple of more I'm missing, I'm sure. But yeah, we, we pretty thick. We we pretty thick. Let me see if I can look this up. Let's see if you if you missed any. Cause that's quite. I didn't expect that many people. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sure I missed a couple. Of, oh, cause he didn't say my name. <laughs> you already. Uh, oh, my whole, oh, June dog. Warren G. Well, day two one three really. He don't. Okay. Warren G don't really bang the pound. Waniac. That's another they they G Funk era. They that's that's okay. more G's group. Waniac and Trip Low. They 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 the twins. The twins, right? Yeah. The twins. Okay, okay. That's what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, they the twins. That's one G's group. R R B X. R B X. Oh, excuse me, X. <laughs> I, excuse me, Big X. Big Long B. Excuse me, homie. <laughs> yeah, he's doing his own thing now. But yeah, he's original. Uh -huh. He's before me. Yeah. Okay. Were you and Daz close? Yeah, we was at one point. Okay. You heard about his current situation? Which one? Well, remember he was beefing with Kanye at one point. Yeah, yeah. And he was, uh, you know. I don't know if I call it beefing. Well, whatever, he whatever you call it. that Kanye. He, he was trolling. He was trolling <laughs> Kanye. <laughs> I'm just, just going to say We're calling it what it is. You know? It is what it is. I'm <laughs> Whoever sure do it, it is he, he what it is. He was trolling Kanye. <laughs> and in the video, he was you know, he's always smoking blunts and everything else like that. Well, apparently some Kanye fans called the police on him. They raided his house because he was living in Atlanta, I believe, at the time. Mm. Somewhere in Georgia. Right, right. And they found a bunch of weed at his house, which to me it looks like personal use. But... You know, there was a bunch of charges in the beginning, and now there's like two felonies, and they're saying he's facing up to 25 years. Wow. And his mom's sick, too. Well, I'm, I'll say a prayer for him later on, man. You know what I mean? That's, that's pretty much the most I can do. Yeah, I'll say a prayer for him later I don't on. think he's going to get any jail time, but the thing that people are kind of explaining to me that you know, Georgia is not California. No, not at all. You, Just because it, it, the exact same thing is legal in California, Georgia doesn't give a fuck. My father-in-law lives out there, and uh, my wife said, we're going to smoke the weed here. <laughs> <laughs> when we get there, we're going to smoke the weed in one secure place there, and that's it. We ain't riding around doing no smoking. We ain't... Uh, yeah, they real 10 years for a joint. So you can get 10 years for a joint. And with all the flexibility in the, you know, in the cannabis world right now with states becoming legal and things like that, they still haven't, uh, they still haven't mentioned anything about legalization in, in Atlanta that I know of. Georgia, so, yeah. Yeah, in Georgia. So I mean, I've smoked weed in Atlanta. It's kind of a scary thought too. now. Now that I think no, about I it, have like, too. yeah, yeah, yeah I, yeah, I smoke weed all around Atlanta. But, right. Yeah, but this was in the '90s, though. Actually, for me, so I haven't, uh, I haven't been in Atlanta in years. Yeah, I was there a few years ago. I smoked weed out there. I hung right. out with Ti and them. Like, yeah. We we're all smoking weed. In yeah, the, I mean, it's the, the company shoot. you with, I'm sure too, yeah. because you know that sometimes they say it's no. We smoke weed in Texas yeah. a couple of months ago, and it's you know they still strict about that too. But police was walking up asking for autographs and taking pictures while we was blowing big old blunts. So uh, I, I hope he goes. He gets through it because people really have to understand that this. Instagram live is the devil. Like, you got to be so careful. Like, I really don't go live very often. 
Maybe. Hardly ever. Nah, I Hardly used to go ever. live on my radio. It's too, it's too unpredictable. unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. And if I say anything a little bit edgy, <laughs> it will always end up somewhere on fucking YouTube or, <laughs> yeah. or some, someone's page or whatever. I, yeah, you as soon as I go live, <laughs> I know a lot of people are recording. <laughs> And I'm not even like famous like that. Like, you know what I mean? Right, like, I'm right. not even like the guy in front of the camera, like a Daz or, right. you know, or whoever else. Like, motherfuckers is like, just realize every time you go on live, there is somebody recording. Mm -hmm. And it can and will be used against you. Right, right. It will be all yeah. the time. All the time. Can and will. Can and will. Yeah. I mean,. When you call attention to yourself like that, though, you know, you, you got to know, like, you know, Lady Gaga and Beyonce, you know, they got super followers that, you know, known to, you know, go vicious on people that got some negative say about their people. Well, I mean, the theory is, and it's a very plausible theory, this is not a conspiracy theory by any search of the imagination, was that when, when Meek Mill went to jail... It was when he was beefing with Drake, and it was Drake fans that were calling the police department and his PO and everything else like that, reporting him for anything. <laughs> you know, I don't want fans like that. Kodak Black, remember he got arrested. He mm -hmm. got sent back to jail for being on live and having like smoking weed, and I think in front of his son. Oh, and I think there was like a gun or something in the video as well. And he was like out on probation or That's parole. That's doing or too much. That's doing too much. Come on, man! You're on parole and you got a gun. And you, come on, man! That's you. That's the first thing you can't do, according to them, is have a weapon. So you kind of like calling attention to yourself. So you got to be smart too. You know, you can't, you know, you can't point the finger at everybody else and saying they wrong for treating you like this and doing this and you putting yourself on blast. That's kind of, you know, it's kind of like running from responsibility. Well, recently there was the whole thing. Remember the Migos said they're the best group of all time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bone Thugs, a couple of guys from Bone Thugs stepped up. Right. They said, no, we're the best group of all time. Eastside is the best group of all time. You know, you should think you have the, you have the best group of all time. Why are you doing it if you don't think you're the best of all time? Yeah. yeah that, that. Of course, I mean, I, I don't understand why anyone would even be offended and someone saying they're the best. The yeah. fuck? Don't like, say you're the best. Don't, you know we the best. You know we the best. Don't say you the best. No, I don't know you the best. I really right. think you know. I really think we better than you. And, but. And, and there's arguments any type of way. Like me and Nick Cannon talked about this, where he goes, "Well, it's an interesting, you know, conversation because you could say that at their height, the Migos were bigger than Bone Thugs at their height." You can, but it's a different way of selling well, music. Well, 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 okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep going with this, right? So, so you could say the Migos are way hotter right now than Bone Thugs when they were super hot, mm. okay? You could also say Bone Thugs may not have been as hot at the time, but their music is standing the test of time, whereas Migos, you're not quite sure. Mm -hmm. You could play Crossroads right now. Motherfuckers will start crying. You can, you can. You, you know, can. Thug and Shruggish Bone and First of the Month is still all-time classics. Notorious Thugs. Notorious Thugs yeah. is still like, yo, you could still play it 20 years later and been like, yo, this is some shit. It is. With Migos, we don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. You but you got to let the time play out to be yeah. fair to see how, because you can say these hits were bigger, but... Yeah. Who knows? They might still be on Bad and Bougie 20 years from right. now. That might still be the shit. Still be the shit. You know, uh, <laughs> now you could say, well, none of those groups put in the work that the East Siders put in. Like, we were really with the streets to, you know. That more. makes us bigger and better and different. That and, makes and, us more authentic and, and, and yeah, the biggest yeah. street group of all. You know, yeah. you, you, could, you could argue with it however the fuck you we want We went to platinum argue. in seven months and it took y'all yeah. nine months. <laughs> right, know? exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That, that type of thing, right? Yeah. Well, in the process of, of, of going through this whole back and forth, um, Busy Bone went on live and pulled out what looked like a musket <laughs> or something. <laughs> So I guess to threaten Offset or whoever, once again, 
he got the police called on him, <laughs> and the police showed up and arrested him alive. Did you hear about this? No? No, I didn't. Yeah. I, did. I heard something about a musket, but I didn't associate it with bone well, Apparently, they were this, looking for Lincoln's murder thing. weapon. You know, they were trying to find Lincoln's murder <laughs> weapon, and they... They had a positive ID with that gun that he had in the video. So, oh, wow. you know, that's no longer a Did cold case. Did he get case. out of jail? Did he get yeah, out of jail? Yeah, he's out. That's cool. He's out. <laughs> Shout out to Bone Thugs and Migos, man. Both of them made dope music. Yeah, Both of them made dope music. I mean, and I wasn't a big new music fan when I came home, you know. Um, you know, I, I got introduced to certain, certain songs and certain groups by my wife, and then, you know, I... I listen to it a couple of times, be like, okay, that dude got a cool little vibe to it. I can see mm -hmm. it in the club, you know, and then when I went to a few clubs, I saw the, you know, the, the, the music that they were playing and the effect that it had. I seen, you know, girls singing background lyrics to, you know, the songs. They know the song all the way through. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, wow, I'm like, damn, this, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new vibe, it's a new yeah. energy. So. I, you know, I shout out to both of them. They big ass, gigantic groups. I, I, I've interviewed I love both, both of, of their music. I've interviewed both groups multiple times. Various members. I did. I, matter of fact, I did Migos' first interview ever. How's that? Dope. How's that? Dope. Totally by yeah. accident. I, I can't take credit for it. Yeah. I was asked the, their their manager, Coach K, asked me to do it as a favor, in exchange for a Gucci Mane interview. And the Gucci interview never happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You still owe me that for that one, Coach K. But I did it as a favor because I didn't know about him at the time. This was before Versace, before mm -hmm. Drake dropped, you know, hopped on Versace. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the rest is history. But, yeah, uh, yeah you never know who's going to be the next Migos, the next Bone Thugs. I Versace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. But listen, stop, stop flashing your guns on social media. The police are watching. Uh, let me let me just substantiate that. When I came home from prison, my parole officer, one of the last things he told me after our initial visit, he said, watch what you do on social media because my supervisor follows you. Mm. And I had like about maybe like two or 3,000 Twitter followers and my niece was running my Instagram page because I wasn't familiar with that. I'd mm -hmm. been gone for 10 and a half years. So she was just getting me up and letting people know, you know, what I was out and I did a few shows when I came mm -hmm. home and stuff like that. So I was like, your supervisor? He said, yeah, you know, we don't even really, uh, <laughs> we don't even really bother uh, monitoring people the way we used to because everything is right here up front for us. <laughs> I said, okay, cool. I said, cool. It's good to know. I, you know, and I'm, I, I, I kind of like know the the rules of self incrimination and all yeah. that. So, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. A lot of people don't. They think that's cool. Like, oh yeah, when I show them this big old gun, they gonna know not to come fuck with me. But guess what? Everybody know you got that big ass gun. Now. Yeah. Including the police. Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Even your enemy. So if they smart, they gonna come try to knock your ass down for you shoot that motherfucker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> you putting yourself in a bad situation, just exposing your artillery anyway. So yeah, it's a lot of stupid shit that that need to cease as far as the you know cloud chasing and all that, man. Well, Twenty One Savage on his new album, he had a lyric. I can't find it off the top of my head here. But he says something to the effect of he wouldn't snitch on his brother and he wouldn't snitch on his enemy either. Do you consider that same type of code? Mm -hmm. I'm not snitching on nobody. So your worst enemy, you will give that person the same pass that you will that you would your closest friend. It's just a it's not even a pass. It's just I'm not helping the police do shit. Mm. You know, it's not the person that I'm not telling on. It's this, I'm not telling. Hmm. I'm not telling. I don't got no information to share. None. You know, I was in a situation like that before I came home. I got a dirty test. And, you know, I had to holler at the yard cop 
to see if he would be, you know, cool enough to hide my shit until my parole date came up and I could slide out without okay. having to answer to the dirty test. So the dirty, what, you tested positive for weed or something? Weed, weed. Okay, so you're yeah. smoking weed in prison? Every day. Every day. Yeah, okay. every day. <laughs> At least four or five times a week. Okay. You know? But, uh, yeah, um, and before I did, I hollered at my homeboy, Tiny Fudge, said, look, homie, this the situation with me. This is my little homie, but I'm letting him know. If any questions or speculation arise, this is what's going on. I got this dirty test. I hollered at my boss up in the kitchen. He said, look, the only way you might get out of that is hollering at this dude on the yard. I'm not going to say his name because uh, – and he was like the worst motherfucker you'll want to talk to or fuck, you know, be around because he always peeping and trying to see who got something going on. But I told my homie, I said, sit right here on the bench by the basketball court. I'm finna go holler at him about this situation. And as soon as I walked up on him, that was my first intro. Check this out. I got a situation. I was told to holler at you. But I don't have no information for you in return. And this is a, a CEO that you're talking yeah, about. Yes, a CEO. Okay. Yeah, that's a CEO. Yeah. I have no information in return to give you for this favor that I'm about to ask you. Mm -hmm. So you can just either tell me to beat it right now or what's the situation. And he actually looked out for me. He actually looked out for me because I know I was dirty. And they caught me like a couple weeks right before I was going home with a so test. So you wouldn't have gone home? No, I could have got another 90 days or something Oof. like that. Yeah, it's 90 Three days. Three months. Of, yeah. When you're counting the days to your final day, I know that was just... Yeah, yeah. What are those last couple of days like? Shh. It, it, I, it, I guess it all depends on how much time you serve. Because when I was coming home after like, the, you know, when I was doing the 18 months and the 23 months, it was like... Oh shit! I'm finna get out, go back to the hood, and you know it's cracking, and finna do this, and you know I gotta get me a pistol real quick, and this, that, and other. You know, you eager to get right back in the mix. Mm -hmm. This time, it was like, damn. First thing I gotta do is find me a solid source of income. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying, and uh, stabilize my relationship with my family, my children, things of that nature and build from there. So I came home with a much more mature perspective this time than I, I had never did 10 and a half years before. So, you know, the two years and the three years and the nine months, back to the program. Well, you missed, <laughs> you went from what year to what year? Uh, 2003 to 2014. November 2003 to April 2014. So you, you missed the whole, you missed the whole mid to late 2000s, early 2010s, just gone. All that shit that happened is... All of it just yeah, passed, passed by me while I was in the bird cage. You were in a unique position because you could get out and you could do shows, you could sell features. You actually had a legal source of income because of the work you put in before. True. The average person who does 10 years usually is not in that same boat. Not at all. No way Unless there's some Wall Street banker no or whatever Nowhere near else. that boat. He's but a lower, but a typical lower income person who does 10 years, they get out with a serious felony on their record and very few prospects of making legitimate income. How many people have you seen that get out and play the straight and narrow? As opposed to just most, go back in. Most now. Most, most now. now. Yeah, the, 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 the fly shit now is to have a good job. Mm. You know, if you was in the game before, <laughs> you know, and you escaped, you know, with a little bit of fed time or, you know, a couple of times in the state and now you got kids and, you know, you got a home and this, that, and the other. The fly shit is to have a job now, you know, so you're not putting yourself at risk of losing everything that, you you know, you've acquired. You know what's very interesting is that I asked the same question to Freeway Ricky Ross and to Lil D, mm -hmm. both of which were multimillionaires going into prison, mm -hmm. allegedly. Mm -hmm. Both of them allegedly stashed money, property, and everything else like that with friends, relatives, and so forth. 
And both of them said when they got out, all that shit was gone. And when you get all that time, you have to trust somebody. You got to let people owe money. You got to let people have their, your, your properties and their names. And majority of the guys that you will have a conversation with that did a bunch of those years, throughout those years, family and friends, they going to spend that money, man. Because they feel like you don't need it, though. Like they, In their mind, they say, all you need is some money to go to the commissary and get on the phone. Same thing with you? Same thing. Same thing. Identical stories. Identical. Yeah. So all these people that are getting locked up who think that their the relatives and their homies are going to hold on to that half a million in cash and that it, property and those cars and when you, you know come what? out. And when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're doing it, you're thinking like you're going to accumulate this stuff. And when you come home, you will have that. Yeah. But when you came out, you had nothing. Nothing. So all this stuff that people were holding was all gone. Zero. That's what my next book is about. Gone like a motherfucker. The money got spent up. Yeah. The property was now in other people's names, and they weren't really <laughs> trying to sign it back over to you. <laughs> yeah. And they'll justify it. <laughs> well, you know, you, I mean, you didn't really need it. No, I mean, I, mean, I, you know, yeah. I have my family, yo, so I'm sorry. Right. Right. That's this how is I what happens. <laughs> that's how, that's the all the I all mean. the wannabe kingpins that are watching this right now that think like, well, yeah, well, I'm gonna do five years, but I'm gonna come out a multimillionaire. No, you're not. Whoever's holding that shit <laughs> is gonna spend it. I was talking to one of my homeboys earlier today, and he was cussing out his daughter, talking about she didn't worked him a few times. You know, on money he got, like, man, I can't believe this damn girl, man, told me she was going to do this and that, got my motherfucking money, and I ain't seen a dime. And, I, you know, so, yeah, even your own family. Your you, own? Yeah. Well, because you're, you're giving a bunch of money to someone who's probably poor. If you're poor or you <laughs> were poor... <laughs> <laughs> Whoever you're giving yeah. it to is probably poor. Yeah, yeah. You know, Chances yeah, are, if yeah, you yeah. give 100000 to Jay-Z, he's probably not going to spend it, exactly. right? But how many Jay-Zs do you know when you get locked up? <laughs> zero. zero. Yeah, zero. Zero. And, and that, to me, was kind of shocking because I'm like, nah, these dudes, you know, and, you know, these are guys, you know, I, I didn't snitch. I took the charge. And I just, all I need you is to hold this money. They wouldn't even do that shit. Nah. I mean, times get hard. Yeah. Times get hard. Now, what I'm going to do, sit here and get kicked out of my house when I got $100,000 of your money <laughs> sitting right here? I no, just leave a little IOU. I, <laughs> I put it back. Don't even worry about it. I'm going to put it back. Right. I, yeah. I only spent 10 Well, I only spent 30 but I, I got you. Right. Know? You yeah. get back a briefcase of IOUs. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you yeah. get after 10 years. That's what you get. So you've seen the same thing. Yeah, I have. This is what happened. Yeah, it is. It is. In almost every case. In almost you every know, case. Yeah, yeah. You might have a nice car that you put up somewhere at somebody's house in their garage or something that might still be there, you know, and uh, that's about all you can hope for. That's about any, it. Any, any, any tangible finances, you know, it's after doing, you know, a bid. I mean, because, you know, people run into situations out here where, you know, they required to take care of themselves, too. I can't take care of your money and not be able to take care of myself, yeah. too. I, I think the most, like, shocking thing is when they said, you know, when they put property in other people's names and then they get out and it's now in other people's names. And it's just, <laughs> how do you convince that person to, to sign it back over to you? Do not. You see what you, I'm saying? You're not. You're not getting that back. Yeah. What you gonna do? Kill me now and get get it back? You you can't do that. But it's like that's the same. Go back to the saying. There's no honor among thieves. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Now, working man, mm -hmm. you gonna you gonna put your money somewhere where you know more than likely it'll be there when you get out. You're not yeah. gonna trust, you know, cousin Bob or something like that. Because <laughs> just because he got a job, that, yeah. you know, and and the family. To take care of your money. He got needs and desires, too. It's too tempting. Yeah. Gucci Mane, he went on the radio uh, not too long ago, and he said, Eminem is not the king of rap. Mm-hmm. As a rapper yourself, do you consider Eminem the king of rap? Never have. Never have. But, I, you know, I just want to point out that Trady's a lyrical rapper. Mm-hmm. Not a mumble rapper. Not at all. Not a, you don't waste time on the, on the beat. <laughs> right. 
you don't go in there and just freestyle and say, "Go, let's go to the next song." You you write. Yes, I do. You know, you could tell by your style that that this is a craft that you've developed over over decades. Right. Yes. When you look at Eminem as someone who does the same type of thing, mm-hmm. what do you think? I think he's great. He's great. I think he's a great rapper. Mm-hmm. Um, I know a lot of great rappers, you know, and uh, I don't consider none of them the king. Yeah? Snoop? No. Snoop is a top dog on the West Coast. Him and Cube, I give it to them. You know what I'm saying? They hold they hold up the coast for us. You know, Ice-T, legend, pioneer, mm-hmm. you know, salute him up. King T, salute, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? But, you know, they like... They the pillars, the east side and the west side, you know, Snoop and Cube. I, I look at them like that, but no, I don't look at nobody like the king. If I would give anybody a king of rap status, it would be Rakim. Okay, so you consider Rakim. He would be the king of rap. He would be the king of rap if you were to have to pick one single. He would be the king of rap. I can see why someone like you would say that. Right, you know what I mean. Right, because I mean, because his, I, I, I can see how his the, complexities. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Patterns based and, on your style, yeah. I could see how you would look at a, a rock him and say, "Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah." He's if that, that's something I aspire a word to do. Wasted, yeah, not a wasted word, not a a a, a bar thrown in there for rap sake. You know, damn, what can I find to rhyme with silver? Uh, you know, give her, and I'm going to make that come, you know what I mean? So none of that. It's always a consistent progression to where he's going in his, in, in his lyrics, in his style, you know, the double, uh, you know, the double rhymes inside. I mean, he's phenomenal. He's phenomenal. And if it would, any anybody would be the king, probably, you know, or or maybe, um, you know, maybe a, LL Cool J or KRS One just for their longevity and you know showmanship, or, you know, and you know commitment to the culture, things like that. Let me let me put it like this: KRS One's "Love's Gonna Get You" to me is one of the top five best rap songs of all time. Yeah, let us move on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. "Love's Gonna Get You." Yeah. If you haven't heard this because you're a little bit younger. Go watch that video. Right. Go go watch the video and look at the the, the storytelling mm-hmm. along with the message, with the with the way he put it all together, with the beat, is an absolutely phenomenal piece of hip hop art. Yeah, it is. It is. And you really can't take nothing away from the people who identified themselves as the kings of rap. Run DMC. Yeah. They made hit after hit after hit after hit after hit. After hit, you know, I mean, they they were hip hop at one time. They were the epitome of hip hop at one time. So when I think of King, I think of somebody like you know that really like the contribution to rap. It it probably rap probably would hip hop probably wouldn't be the same mm-hmm. had they not entered it. Did you watch the documentary on Netflix about uh, Jam Master J and his murder? No, I didn't. I didn't. It's a very, very interesting uh, documentary. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I always feel like I know everything, you know, because of everyone I talk to <laughs> on and off camera. But yeah. I actually learned a few things from watching that documentary. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, his murder is unsolved. Yeah. Right? Is. But I'd always heard these rumors that before he died, he was mixed up on some, with some street shit and some drug shit because his money was low, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you hear little rumblings, but it was never, you know, actually clarified or expanded on. So I just figured, okay, that's just nonsense. So in this documentary, there, you know, was was Jay, you know, was uh, was Jam Master Jay dealing drugs at the end. And all his friends like that. That's ridiculous. This guy's an international star. He was touring, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was ridiculous. Yeah, no, he was, he was. And then they got to this one guy, right? Mm-hmm. One of his close friends, he goes... Well, yeah, uh, near the end, Jay's money was really low, and they went out, him and a couple other, Jay, him, and, you know, some other person went out to L.A. to try to flip their money. Jay, Jay-Z? 
Uh, Jam Master J. Oh, okay. Yeah. Jam Master J and a couple of his people went out to L.A. to flip their money, mm-hmm. and they ended up losing their money. You know, it didn't didn't work out, so they did a plan B, and plan Bs never work oh, out in the drug game, yeah. and they basically went back home down like twenty, thirty thousand dollars 30000 And we don't know whether that had anything to do with his death, but it was sort of an interesting situation where you see someone who is you know, has made all this legitimate rap money go back and try to risk their freedom doing some drug shit. Because mm-hmm. that's actually, you know, Buju Bantan just came home right. from doing the exact same thing, yeah. essentially. <laughs> yeah. He tried to flip kilos yeah. with an undercover. <laughs> he just came home. How long was he gone? He was gone like maybe eight years or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, welcome home, Buju. Welcome home, Buju. Um, have you seen that type of thing where people try to get mixed up in some drug shit when they really had no no business doing it? Hmm. I never really been close to the drug game as far as interacting with dealers and things like that. And that because I told you, you know, m- motherfuckers wasn't trying to see me coming. You know what I'm saying? I was, I was the big bad wolf. You know what I'm saying? Trying to blow your doors down. Well, I mean, I, I've actually, you know, me and you never talked about it, but I said this story in a couple of my other interviews uh, not too long ago. I actually try to get, I, I, I got myself mixed up with one of my homies and I put, a, put up some money to buy some Coke and he ended up just robbing me basically the money yeah <laughs> <laughs> point blank that was the, the beginning and end of my drug career and i was already graduated from school i had a i had my own business i was making money and i suddenly had this i had just seen deep cover and i somehow came up with this idea that i'm going to do this on the side oh, and man. and he robbed me the first and this was my homie he robbed me the first time and i remember i was talking to freeway ricky about this yeah. and we both talked about how how lucky i got that that was pretty much the end of it. Right. You know right. what I mean? And, and hopefully it wasn't the large lump sum. That, it was that, It was pretty large, unfortunately. For you at the for time. For me at the was, time. Yeah, right yeah. now it's not, <laughs> yeah. but it's still an amount that I'm like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I was that stupid. Like, What he doing? What the guy doing right now? He living his life. I ran into him. He all right? He, he Some doing years all right? later. <laughs> And he said, oh, when I ran, he said, no, no, I'm going to pay you, man. I just got paid through American Express. You know, I got you. You know, just open up American Express. And I went and got the account and he stopped returning <laughs> my calls after that. And, <laughs> but it was, it was a very interesting feeling at the time because I'm like, okay, he just, you know, he's, he clearly just robbed me of this money. Only thing I could really do at this point is violence. That's it. I can't call the police. That's I can't sue it. them. I can't do nothing. <laughs> Violence is my only answer. That's your only option. And it wasn't an option for me. I didn't have a crew, and I wasn't going to do it myself. Right, right. And uh, it was it was a very eye opening kind of experience. Yeah. Don't don't get involved. In don't shit get involved you ain't ready for. in shit that you're not ready for. <laughs> yeah. You know. I remember I was yeah. talking to my, my my actual D boy homies about this, and I'm like, "Where'd they go wrong?" He goes, "Now we'll see. You always got to be with the money." See, that's yeah. that's the problem. You you let the money go on its own. You got to be with it at every step. And I'm like, shit, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but look how it turned out. Though. It turned out cool. <laughs> and, and I take a certain amount of solace because this was someone I was running with. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to say what our connection is because... It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Yeah. But had he not done that... He could have potentially been involved in all the various businesses that I've been in over the years, and he could have made 50 times that. Fucking, yeah. with, fucking with me. Yeah, yeah, man, that's what you do. You let people play themselves. You yeah. know what I'm saying? That, and I, I, well, after my career of jacking, you know, for lack of a better term for it, um, I was blessed to realize I had this gift, you know, to spit. Mm-hmm. And, once I realized it for what it was, like you called it, it really is a gift. And it made me appreciate that God had gave it to me, and I made a commitment to myself that I would never 
taint what I was blessed with as a gift with contaminating it with something that was unclean or unpure. Mm -hmm. And before I even, you know, was Muslim, anything like that, that was just how I felt inside about cherishing my gift. You know, so homies would ask me like, hey D, let's do this, you know, and if they was real cool with me, you know, sometime I might be like, well, you know, I got this for you, you know, hopefully this will help you out, do what you gotta do, and you know, I don't expect nothing back. You know, if I need something, I holler at you, but you know, that's you, man, go and do that. And I would never try to, you know, get mixed up in none of that. Takashi 6 9 still in jail. Court date in September. September of this year. They're saying that he might get a bail package. He's trying to put up about $1.5 million. They're saying he might get it. Wait a minute. Didn't he just buy his bro like a, a, a yeah. $700,000 car or something like that? Not a 700. I mean, he bought it maybe a $100,000 car. Oh, the $100,000 Yeah, G-Wagon. 700000 oh. would be like a... Oh. I don't even know. What no, I thought he bought us some, some no, real flying. That'd be like him. two Rolls Royces. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or, or a good Bugatti or something. It, it, it's funny. Years. Well, there's a picture of him with his you know new girlfriend, and he's like grabbing her butt and everything else like that. Apparently, there's no conjugal visits, though. No, you got to be married. You got to be married. Yeah. Yeah, conjugal visits are for married people. Because, for example... Joel Santana is going into, I think he's turning himself in for like two years or something like that. And he got married right before he went in. So, are you so he could have he's sex. Married in the courtroom. Were you married while you were locked up? No. No. None of that. I was married, but I, I, me and my wife was done. And then, you know, my new wife, we was building our relationship at the time. Oh, really? Oh, so you met her... But no, no. We knew her before. Before? Yeah. Okay, it wasn't like one of those pen pals. No, 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 I don't do that shit. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, you know, that's 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 playing to lose, you know what I'm saying? You you confessing all these feelings for somebody you ain't even met, you know. I'm not really with that. You, you see that a lot, man. You do, and most people get used in that situation. Especially, Somebody get especially used. Especially seems with, with overweight women. Yeah, they Overweight get used. women... Get into these pen pal situations with these men in prison. Uh, I, I remember there is a you can watch it on, on Netflix. There's a series with Tracy Morgan called The Last OG. Oh, yeah, you seen yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. No, I heard of it, the last. It's pretty OG. good, but yeah, p- part I of like pl- Tracy Morgan. He's yeah, hilarious. yeah. You know, part of the <laughs> the plot line was this this fat white girl that had been holding him down in prison. He gets out and he <laughs> she starts trying to hunt him down and like. <laughs> That's how it goes. That's how I use it. And that's and so he's trying, sad. He's trying to duck her. And, yeah, that's yeah. so sad, man, because some of these women be with these guys for like years. I mean, and they'll get out and won't even go see the chick, man. You know what I mean? You know, after all this good shit, you know, she sent them clothes to wear home and everything. And that's the, you know, don't never see hide nor hair of them. I don't, really feel, I don't really feel sorry for the women. Honestly, you're an adult. You know what you're getting into. Yeah. You know what you're getting into. You start a relationship with a man who's in a cage. It's not, he's not there because he likes you that much. But I mean, my thing is not the women so much. It's the guys that is, you know, that taint them for the next person that might really, you know what I'm saying, have some kind of desire because, you know, it's somebody for everybody. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And just because a chick overweight, that don't really mean no. she a bad person. No, or no, like not that. at but all. Listen, a lot, a lot of heavyweight women are in great relationships, mm-hmm. uh, loving loving husbands, loving boyfriends, everything else like that. I'm some just saying. Some like them chunky. You yeah, know? some like them chunky. Uh, but <laughs> what I'm saying is when you establish a relationship as a pen pal situation, you, you should, should know. You should expect <laughs> that, that that relationship will probably end once that person walks out that door <laughs> yeah. and is I no longer in the same position <laughs> yeah. as when the relationship was in full swing. Yeah, I can't disagree <laughs> with that. Yeah, I can't disagree. I mean, this guy stay in the mirror longer than you. He come out of <laughs> the visiting room and his, his hair all did, he neatly groomed, and you... You know, yeah, you should know. You should pretty much know. You just a stepping stone or 
you know, somebody that's just helping him out in this situation right now because, you know, you, in there you can't really hustle unless you can draw or, you know, you got a particular skill like you can cut hair or something. Other than that, you ain't doing no robbing in there, or, you know, no selling dope unless somebody bringing it to you. So, uh, Freeway Ricky, uh, he, uh, he mentioned something interesting. I don't remember whether there was this, it was in our interview or – or something else that he had maybe said or, or written about. But he said that while he was locked up, he met a lot of people that had life in prison because they were in a beef with somebody mm -hmm. that got out of hand. Mm -hmm. And most of them said, I could have talked to the person and settled it. But my own ego and pride prevented that from doing it. So it just kept escalating until the person ended up dead or, you know, shot or whatever else. And, and here I am now over a situation that could have been very easily fixed. Yeah. Can you relate to that? Hell yeah, I can. Remember we talked uh, one of our earlier interviews when you asked me. Matter of fact, I put the skit on my uh, on my album, my third, uh, my third coming album, when you asked with... Uh, uh, what, how, how, how words affect me to this day, mm -hmm. and you know, could I had said the same thing twenty years ago? And mm -hmm. I said, of course not. I mean, yeah, you know, it's a multitude of situations where you just don't want to let it go. It's just like you know, no, nah, this, you know, this guy got to know that he can't talk to me like this, or he can't get at me like this, or whatever. And then, you know, yeah, ego, ego, and pride. That, that take more men down than, you know, than the police in poverty. You know, with my own personal uh, self development, you know, I'm I'm a consider myself somewhat of a grudgeful person, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I was I was thinking about the you know the MC Search MC Hammer situation where Search says he still wants to put a pistol in the guy's mouth and you know <laughs> blow his head off and and, and so forth. I just want to like put a gun in his mouth, you know what I mean? Like, like, but but that's me. Like, that's my anger. That has nothing to do with him. That's like me taking poison and waiting for him to die. That's my poison that I have to deal with. That I have to live with. Wow. Yeah, that, that, that was one of the things in the search interview. He goes, yeah. He goes, I wish I don't want to, you know, don't think about sticking a, a you know a pistol in MC Hammer's mouth just so he could feel what I felt when. You know, those guys are trying to kill me and stuff like that over that whole situation. He still feels that way. And, and I started thinking about it a little bit in terms of internalizing it because I'm like, wow, that's, you know, whatever, 25 years later. And I started thinking about someone who uh, ended up, I got into a fight with and lost in high school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I felt like he kind of sucker punched me. And I realized that I was mad at him even after he committed suicide years later. Right. And I was trying to figure out how I could maintain an anger towards a person who's dead that I will never work it out with. Mm -hmm. I'm out, I can never punch him back. Right. You know, and, yeah. and, and feel like we're even now. Right, yeah, yeah. And what helped me a lot is this sort of flashbulb that went over my head where I said, What was my role in that altercation? Where did I go wrong? Mm -hmm. And for the first time I said, well, you know, I rolled up on his homie because I thought his homie had done something to me. And he punched me kind of protecting his friend. Oh, yeah, like a real friend. Like, joke. And I'm like, would I have, <laughs> yeah. I might have done the same thing. I was kind of, <laughs> yeah, I was like angry. A real friend will do. I was angry and on some bullshit myself that day. I was kind of angry during that whole year, I remember. Yeah. I was on some bullshit myself, and you know, I probably deserved to get punched to a certain degree. And once I took responsibility for my own actions, mm -hmm. it made me feel better about the whole thing. Yes, sir. And, and it, it was it's something that I try to apply to everything in life that, that upsets me. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised how well that works. Taking responsibility... For yeah. your role in everything. Yes. 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 That was a, um, you know, that was a situation that I had encountered 
in the contractual um, dispute I had, and it was like that was Snoop. Yeah, it was like well, the you know regardless of who put what in the paperwork or what I didn't expect or I imagined that it would go a particular way, I still had to own up to the fact that I put my signature on that contract. Right. And I had ample time to, you know, take it to this lawyer, take it to a manager, Mm -hmm. take it to this. But I'm just so convinced that, you know, hey, motherfucker know better than to fuck with me. You know what I mean? And that's not business. That's not American business. A motherfucker will fuck you over and and look at you and be like, well, I mean, it was all right here in the contract. And yeah. what you gonna do, kill me? Are you gonna kill me now because you, you signed the contract? So you have to own up. You have to take some sort of responsibility. Well, you have to take full responsibility for whatever your action was. And it, it helps me too that I said last year that I was going to quit being so judgmental mm-hmm. of people. And I try not to do that now. Even situations where I don't agree with certain people, I'm not so quick to respond to it or highlight it because a lot of times it's not even my business. And other times it's like, well, what's the positive angle that will come from me addressing this or highlighting this. And if it's not one, I just, you know, I just breeze right past it. And that works for me. In the in the world of Navy SEALs, mm-hmm. you know, a military team is considered the best in the world mm-hmm. or one of the best in the world, depending on what country you speak to. Mm-hmm. They have a concept called extreme ownership mm-hmm. where every person on the team takes full responsibility of the entire situation, regardless of what their particular part is or regardless of what happens externally to make the situation go wrong, they take full responsibility for it. And they actually teach these methods to CEOs and so forth. Mm-hmm. Extreme ownership. You know, in almost every situation that's gone bad in life, you could say, I shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have did that. I could that's have reacted real. a different way. That's real. I could have not responded this way. I could have calmed the situation down. I could have stayed home instead of going out. I, you know what I mean? Yeah. There, there's always something you could do to say, I'm going to take responsibility for this. True that. I'm not. and Because the thing is, I think the thing that pisses most people off is they don't want to feel like a victim. Mm. And when you blame it on the other person, you put yourself into a, a victim mentality. That's and that's true. what pisses you off. Especially as men. Yeah. Yeah. Men don't like feeling like victims. That's a good game. That's a good game right there. I'm in my 40s, man. Uh, (laughs) You try to, you can't be on the same bullshit as as your your 20s. You can't. You (laughs) You can't. Because you was a whole different person then. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of things that you didn't know and a lot of things that you didn't accept about others and yourself, you know, at that time. So, yeah, maturity is beautiful, man. I'm living it every day and loving it. That's how we're going to end it. Trey D, until next time. Until next time. Peace. Yep.